So I was thinking about internet privacy over the weekend, and you know what? As an industry, we have really got to start cleaning ourselves up. And in particular, in this video, I want to focus on the practice of... So I'm sure you're thinking, what is browser fingerprinting? Well, it's a technique being used by a lot of ad companies and retailers to identify you without relying on third-party cookies. So what do I mean by this? So let's go on my pad and I'll show you what I mean. Okay, so let's put you in the middle here for a second. So this is me. And what is basically happening is when you interact on the internet, and I'll give you a demonstration of what that looks like in a second, your browser is giving away quite a bit of information about you. So the sort of things that it will give away is what is your browser type? Yeah, so it could be Chrome, it could be Firefox, it could be whatever. It also is going to be given away your version number of your browser. And if you think about it, lots of people will be on different versions at different uh, times. It also gives away things like the language. Are you a uh, UK-based language? Are you a US-based language? Maybe you're in Tanzania and you've got Swahili set. So you could have your language there. It'll also be giving away things such as your time zone. So what time zone are you currently in? And you can also find out by manipulating the date object what time zone uh, you would be in the 1st of November or the 1st of May. And you can use those calculations to say, okay, this person is in daylight savings in the UK or daylight savings in the US. There is also even more information that could be potentially given away, such as what graphics card you're running, or also what the make and model of your computer is, right? Is it a, a Mac? Is it a PC? Then other information that could be given away could be uh, what plugins you have installed on your machine. Maybe you've got a version of uh, an old version of Flash running. Maybe you've got something like Silverlight. Maybe you've got Windows Media Player. Um, but essentially, the browser allows the web pages to interact with the plugins object and, and get all of those values back. Or there is other things that could be given away, and this is a popular one, is what screen dimensions do you have, right? What screen size does your machine support? Uh, what is it defaulting to? And then, and you can even access things like audio. What audio hardware are you running? And again, other things could be things like keyboard, right? What keyboard are you running? Is it a QWERTY keyboard? Is it an AZERTY keyboard? Um, again, depending on the country that you're in, that could, could vary and change. There are a few other things that you have access to underneath, which also includes things like the canvas. So that is a drawing area that you can access where you can maybe draw a picture or write some text. And then depending on the machine, different machines and models will behave differently to how you write to that canvas. And that information can help figure out whether you are the same person on one machine as another. And the final thing that you can interact with is the font. So by sort of doing a bit of a brute force and enumeration, you can find out which fonts are installed on a user's machine. Now, why is all of this information important? Because if you think about it, if you apply this statistically, each piece of this information on its own probably doesn't uniquely identify you. But if you were then to start combining that information in multiple places, then that could uniquely identify you. For example, if I go to amiunique.org, then it will give you a view of all of these settings that you've got on your local machine that is being exposed to any website that you interact with. So as you can see from my screen, it asks the question, are you unique? And it says, yes, you are unique among the three and a half million fingerprints in their entire data set. So let's sort of break down what it's meaning there. So you can kind of see that it's identified that I'm running a Mac and it's sort of 10% of the, the user base are running Macs. You can kind of see 41% are running Chrome, but only 0.05% are running version 90 of Chrome. As you can see, I'm in the UK, I'm on daylight savings time. So my UTC plus one is the current time zone that I'm in just now. And that only represents 15% of the users. And then you can see on um, uh, my language is English, which is sort of 76%. So actually, if you think about all of these items together, they start to paint a very precise picture of who I am. And if I was to scroll down a little bit further, so if we look at the user agent string, which is sent 
as part of every request to a browser, you can kind of see that it's, it's running Chrome, it recognizes that. You can see it's recognizing that I'm on a Mac and it's got the specific version that I'm running, which is 10.15.7, and then you can see I'm running Chrome 90. So all of that information together, there's less than 0.01% that are running that combination of settings. So that's pretty kind of scary stuff. It's getting really precise to identify me now. If I go a little bit further, you can see that I'm running uh, ENGB as my language. That's only 1.77% on there. You can then see, if we scroll down a little bit further, you can see that I'm running Mac Intel as my platform. I've got cookies enabled. You see my time zone is minus 60. And then you've got this canvas test. That was the thing I was saying before, whereas if you write some text onto a machine, it's only going to respond in certain ways for certain machines and it becomes easy to identify. So you see it's put this sort of text in there, CWM Ford Bank, and, and uh, it's done a comparison and only 0.27% of the machines uh, actually return things in that way. And again, here's the big one that we were talking about before. It's got this unique list of fonts. So actually they were be able to identify a lot of the fonts on my machine and those specific combinations of fonts that I have actually become really easy to identify me because depending on what I'm doing in my machine, what applications I've got installed will really depend on what fonts I have. So therefore, identifying me becomes really, really easy. So if, if I were to combine how my machine works with Canvas, the list of fonts that I have, what platform I'm on, what browser version, what OS version I've got, um, and, and the fact that I've got eight meg of memory and I've got these plugins installed, which represent 13%, it, it starts to become really easy to really identify me from machine to machine, right? It's just a combination of those items. And again, if we go further and look at the screen width and height and the depth and the uh, uh, the available height width, you can, again, look at the numbers there, right? How my screen dimensions are uh, make it really easy to identify me as well. And if I go down a little bit further as well, it's even accessing my graphics card, as I explained earlier, right? So it's an Intel graphics card. You can see it's UHD Graphics 617. And actually, if I were to, if I were to Google that and, and bring this up here, so let's just go into this, um, you will see that graphics card 617. Let's just uh, scroll down here. Um, but if I scroll down here, uh, you, what you're going to be seeing is the 617 is can be found in wide processors and is suited for very thin, mostly passive, cool subnotebooks like the MacBook Air 2018, which is the exact MacBook that I'm running. So here we go. We've identified that I'm running a MacBook 2018. You've got the exact version of Chrome. You've got how much memory I've got in the machine. You've got my particular screen resolutions. You know what time zone I'm in. You know, you know what plugins I've got installed and whatnot. And you've got what particular fonts I've got installed and which ones I haven't got. And if you take all of that data together, then it's pretty easy to identify who I am, whether I have a cookie installed or not. So that's how browser fingerprinting works. And it is being used by a lot of companies. So whether it's retailers, whether it's ad networks, whether it's nefarious companies, they're using these underhanded techniques to figure out who you are and then be able to track you across the internet. Now, there is a lot of browsers that are doing work to uh, go against that. So things like Brave browser is getting pretty good at this. Brave is a sort of privacy first browser that's built on top of the Chromium open source engine, which is the same engine that Google Chrome uses. Within Brave, if we go to settings and we click on shields and we scroll down to fingerprint blocking, you can see it's by automatically set to standard. But if I set that to strict, then that's going to obfuscate a lot of those settings. So if I go back onto the MI Unique and hit refresh and we have a look at it, it's helped, but I can still be uniquely identified even with a secure browser like Brave. But there is a few areas where Brave has actually done a really good job of hiding some of that data. So if we look at the user agent side of things, it's it's still fairly identifiable because the version that I'm on is still being exposed uh, and it's still exposing my OS version. 
Um, so, you know, you can argue that's still identifiable there. But if I go down into some of the other areas, it's still identifying that I'm running on a Mac, for example. The, the canvas uh, fingerprint technique, it's not helping there, right? So there isn't a technique to sort of stop that just now. Um, but I still allow an access to uh, my sort of plugins there. Um, but what you can see it's doing is it's trying to mess things up a little bit. So if you look at device memory, it says 0 0.25. That's not my device memory, it's 8 meg. So what, what's happening underneath there is Brave is actually modifying this value and switching it around so that the fingerprint will change every time somebody looks at that. So we're kind of getting into this war between the browsers and the uh, ad trackers, um, because by changing these values and the uh, overall hash setting that, that is used, and, and what a hash is, is basically it's just a, you run a hashing function over all these values to get one unique value. But if one of those properties changes, then the hash changes, and therefore your unique fingerprint changes. So uh, in these cases, they're just sort of messing with some of the values and obfuscating some of them. So it makes it more difficult for the ad trackers to, to figure out who you are. So that's something that Brave helps do there. And it also does that with the hardware concurrency. Uh, it, it also removes some of the details from, from user agents. So uh, for example, it doesn't contain the number of logical processors that stripped out there as well. But of course, it's still exposing a bunch of stuff. So things like the, uh, the fonts, for example. So if we, uh, if we go back up to uh, the fonts, it's still exposing you know, the, the fonts that I've got. It, there's nothing to stop that on the Brave browser. But I think I think Brave's doing a really great job of doing that. And I think things like dealing with fonts is later on in their list as well. So I think as browsers build more protections, it's going to be harder and harder uh, for ad trackers to to identify users. But of course it's it's a battle and I think the browser I think the browser companies have just got to do better, right? So I think this is data that and should be treated seriously and it should just be sort of bugs fixed, security enhancements, some of these settings should be made default because you know what the worry is is that's coming from these companies is to say, hey, well, there's a risk that we break the web. Well, I would argue that the web is already broken, right? If, if you're exposing this information and, and I think these companies are accessing that data, then, you know, that we're in a pretty broken state already. So I think, I think browser companies just really need to start fixing these things, make some of that data not available. And if it breaks a web, it breaks a web. Um, but, but we need to get better at privacy there. I think the second thing is, I understand why certain companies are doing this. Um, I understand why they're tracking because they want to serve, serve personalized ads, etc. But you know what? This is a kind of dangerous precedent, right? I don't think going in and having a look at which fonts you've got installed, what your graphics card is. I, I you know what? I it's not great. There, there's other ways of identifying people. There's other ways of being personalized and if people want to be private then we need to be able to respect that so there's a kind of two-way things if 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 you're an ad tracking company for example and you're using these techniques you know what well, that's not a great position to be in and there's a lot of companies that are using this and and you can go to any of the major companies and you can have a look underneath there and, and you will see that device fingerprinting is used and browser fingerprinting is used way more than you would expect now there is a couple of really uh, good reasons why some companies use this and some of that is to detect bots and that makes sense right because if you think about all of these identifying features then you know what that can expose a bot someone who shouldn't be interacting with your system but again it's, it's a really invasive way of doing that so I think as an industry we just need to clean ourselves up a little bit um, start closing down some of these issues and that responsibility has to be with the browser manufacturers well done brave for doing this um, you've got I know you've got much further to go but actually they're a small browser so I think some of the other uh, browser manufacturers really need to uh, double down a little bit more and, and close this out and try and make uh, things a little bit more private so before we finish up I wanted to show how easy it is to get access to some of the, that data you know using JavaScript today so if I just open up a couple of pages I created you can kind of see that if I just go to developer tools for a second, 
you'll see in the console that it's coming back with uh, all the things I said, my processors, my device memory, etc. If I go into the WebGL one, as you can see, it's coming back with the details of my graphics card, so Intel UHD 617, and it's super easy. So if I go into uh, the code for a second, so this is the browser code, and I, you can see I've called something that's get browser and get browser additional. But if I look at that code underneath that, as you can see, all I'm doing is accessing user agent off of the navigator API in JavaScript. And, and it's really as simple as that. If I look at something such as um, WebGL, so let's double click on that, you can see in order to get the information of my graphics card. You can see it's just accessing WebGL, debug renderer info, um, and then I'm just uh, logging it out there. So it's it becomes super easy to get all of that information. And finally, I just thought it would be useful to show um, where Browser Fingerprint is using. So I'm not gonna name the company in question here because I think they're doing this one for legitimate reasons, which is to identify bots. But you can see this is real code that exists on real Fortune 100 websites. And, and as you can see, it's the same techniques that I said uh, before. So they're accessing all the plugin information, you know, trying to see if you've got real player installed, so will I, QuickTime. Um, there, there's the code, and we'll deep dive this in another video, but there's the code for uh, testing which fonts that you've got. So it's just got a big list of fonts there, and then it's gonna attempt to do a write of the font, and if it works, then uh, you know then you know you've got that font installed. Um, if, I, if I go down a little bit further, um, you can also see it's accessing the user agent, the platforms, the minor versions, it's accessing hardware concurrency, so all of that stuff that you saw on my screen earlier. Um, if we scroll down a little bit further, Here's the code for getting your get, get date time offsets and working out which time zone that you're in. Uh, again, here's a bit of code to figure out if you've got cookies enabled or not. Uh, here's some code to, to, to figure out which, which plugins you've got. Here's the code to figure out uh, what language you've got installed, you know, exact same as, as we were showing on the other screens there. And then this is why I think it's probably legit, <laughs> this one, is that you can kind of see that it's uh, looking for Phantom and Call Phantom and, and, and Basically, what that's trying to do is see if Phantom JS is exposed, which is a sort of web automation framework. It's a little bit of an old one, so I'd be expecting them to look for things like headless Chrome, um, you know, using things like Puppeteer, etc., rather than just uh, Phantom JS. But um, but then they're doing these checks to try and see if uh, that robot exists. So you know, and then finally, you can sort of see everything being combined up and and then hashed at the bottom there to to create that fingerprint. So that's an example of something being used in the wild. Um, it's really common. Um, again, I understand. I understand it from a kind of bot detection perspective. I understand it from you want to serve personalized ads, but I don't think that having these vulnerabilities open in our browsers is a good thing. And, and again, I want to applaud those browsers such as Firefox, Brave, etc., that are taking an active stance uh, against these vulnerabilities and trying to fix them. Um, again, not all of them are fixed, uh, but back to my point, right? As an industry, we need to clean ourselves up and we need to close this down and really make a, a private and safe internet for everyone. Anyway, I hope that's been useful. Uh, speak soon.